thank you for the kind introduction. And it's the first lecture that I give that is recorded. So I hope I will forget this fact <laughs> in the course of the lecture. And there's a slight risk that I will slip down the slippery slope of sloppy language. And uh, some of my competitors will look at it and I will criticize them. So I ask in advance uh, for their understanding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will not. Uh, take care of a careful language all the time. So as the introduction said, I am working with STM. So all the stuff I will show you is done, or mostly, is done with STM at low temperatures. So we are going to 4 Kelvin or lower in temperature. And we will in part use um, spin polarized tips. And uh, the subject of uh, the talk is spins on surfaces. That means I will basically uh, have a large overlap with Wolfgang Mernstoffer's talk. The difference is that he discussed the spin Hamiltonian as a function of magnetic field. You had the avoided level crossings, etc. And um, in my talk, since I'm doing STM, my samples need to be conductive. And that means I will couple the spin to the conduction electrons. And there are some consequences. So basically, I will consider uh, a localized spin, let's say an atom, a magnetic molecule on a surface. And for the atom, it's simple. You know there is a Hamiltonian you discussed, which is basically the atomic Hamiltonian. That's the, uh, yeah, the kinetic energy, the central potential, and the electron-electron interaction. And yeah, of course, you recall that to find out what is the ground state multiplet, you use Hund's rules. So this will be kind of a description uh, level I will have here. So only the low energy spectrum of the system. And then um, we have a spin orbit interaction, which is included in the Hamiltonian. And now we have our magnetic atom in a crystal field. That is an electrostatic interaction with a surrounding that breaks rotational symmetry. So we already uh, anticipate what happens. There will be problems with uh, the total angular momentum or or uh, yeah, angular momentum in general, we have an applied magnetic field, the Zeeman field. And the difference to Wolfgang Bernstorff's talk is electrons can now hop on and off um, the atom, and the atom will um, experience exchange interaction with the conduction electrons of my substrate, and of course, also of the tip. So we have 3D and 4F uh, systems in, in my talk. So in principle, it gives LS and J by uh, the Hund's rules. The magnetic field can split this multiplet. The electrostatic interaction with the ligands, if it's a magnetic uh, molecule or the surface, will make this crystal field and it breaks the rotational symmetry. And that will lead to partial quenching of the orbital momentum. I will explain you in a second. That's basically the high energy part. But the crystal field together uh, with a spin <coughs> orbit interaction, uh, also splits the multiplet, the states in the multiplet of the atom, which is called uh, um, the zero field splitting, as also introduced by Wolfgang Mernstoffer. And the electrons may hop on, on and off, as I explained. So there's a rich physics of this. We, I will discuss spin crossover, so you can actually manipulate the size of the spin in an experiment. You will see the condo effect. Um, then the question, uh, can you build a quantum computer with these uh, spins? There are some questions about T1 and T2 times I will discuss. And uh, in principle, if you have many of these coupled together, you can also build superconducting systems, but I uh, didn't discuss that in this talk. So the crystal field, very basic. Um, it uh, lifts the uh, central cinematic potential of the free atom. And the new eigenstates are thus mixtures of the free atom eigenstates in the multiplet. For 3D elements, typically the electrostatic potential of the neighbors is larger than the spin orbit interaction. So this actually breaks J, the total angular momentum, and we should better think of L and S. And then on top of this, the D orbitals are relatively large. Um, they are um, similar extension than the outer other electrons, so they they um, can feel this uh, electrostatic potential quite a bit. That will quench L, as I will show you in the next slide. 
For the 4F elements, um, the spin-orbit interaction now becomes rather large because the, uh, the uh, nucleus is so heavy and typically it's larger than the crystal field. So we can think in terms of the total angular momentum J. And they are also more localized. Um, this is, uh, in fact, due to uh, the filling of the shells. I mean, you start with a 1S. 2S now needs to be further out because already the 1S state is occupied and Pauli principle holds. So the wave functions must be orthogonal to the 1S, so they need to be further out. 2P are basically uh, now differ in the quantum number, so they can be a little bit more in than the 2S. And if you, fill the, if you look at the periodic table, you will see that the 3D is actually similar in extension than uh, the other uh, orbitals. But for the 4F, it's the first F shell. First time you fill an F shell, and there are up to the 6S already occupied. They are really large orbitals. And that means they will be really concentrated. Uh, uh, and uh, the crystal field is screened by the other electrons, basically. So uh, for so if the crystal field is not too strong, um, the orbital states uh, in the presence of the crystal field are states with a good squ S square. So I can tell what is the spin, but not necessarily a good <coughs> quantum number in SZ. Yes? Did you say the 4F orbital is much smaller than the 6? Yes. So basically, the, you fill the shells. If the quant principal quantum number gets larger, you are, you are forced to go out because the close orbitals are already occupied, so the, the state must be orthogonal. But uh, if you have a difference in the orb orbital momentum, then this rule, of course, does not hold. And so the 2P, for example, can be relatively close to the core, closer than the 2S. And now you are at six, uh, in 4F, you are already at 6S, and you fill the 4F. So the principal quantum number is, is uh, much smaller, and these are closer to the nucleus. OK. So you all know this uh, for uh, d orbitals. If we uh, go away from uh, the rotation symmetry, and we, let's say we, we take uh, 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 a cube symmetry, then um, these are the new eigenstates, dz squared, d z, d x y, and d x z, d x squared minus y z squared, and uh, they are linear combinations of the of the spherical harmonics. And what you immediately see if you ask what is um, the magnetic quantum number here, this is simple, it's zero. And then these are linear combinations uh, of plus minus one. If you ask what is uh, the uh, LZ quantum number here, it's also zero, expectation value, sorry. This one is also zero. And uh, you see all of them are, are zero. So we lose um, the Z component of the angular momentum. L. But still, L square, if I take the L square operator, then of course this one on any D wave function, uh, this is now a linear combination, will always give me uh, h bar L times L plus 1. So L square is uh, still a good quantum number. So I can't talk of L and S, uh, uh, I can't talk of S, P, D, F electrons, even in the presence of a crystal field. But the Z quant uh, the, the a Z quantum number here for the XY, that's a linear combination of uh, two, uh, something is, yeah, of plus two and minus two. You see that uh, if I write it down, I get uh, opposite values and then the uh, magnetic moment in Z direction is gone. Um, very often you have uh, octahedral symmetry. So that's basically an atom our central D atom sits here, and we have uh, some nearest neighbors in plus minus z, plus minus x, plus minus y directions. And then you get uh, these orbitals, the eg and t2g orbitals. They are again linear combinations, and you can find, uh, I can look it up. And so you, the eg orbitals, if you ask what is the z component of the angular momentum, is zero for this one, it's zero for this one. Um, this is minus one. Um, this is one and this is zero. So you can 
partially quench the orbital momentum. So there can still be some orbital momentum left, but not of the whole uh, size. Now, as I told you, um, uh, the crystal field can be, uh, in, in 3D elements can be really large. And um, there is a situation, I'll give you an example, iron 2 plus with six uh, three, uh, 3D electrons, three uh, D electrons. So if I would split the states in this octahedral uh, symmetry, I get the three and uh, the two states here, and I would just fill uh, these states regarding Hund's rules. So like one, two, three, four, five parallel, and one anti-parallel, this one has S equal two. It still has some orbital momentum. I, I'm in principle, I can, on this level, I can put the electron here, here, and here. So there are three options. So the multiplet in L will have three options, so L is equal one. You immediately can see from this graph. Um, but the energy scale here is, of course, given by the exchange of the order of one electron volt in this system. And if my crystal field becomes larger than one electron volt, so if I have very close nearest neighbor to my 3D um, ion in this case, then um, the crystal field wins and I break Hund's rule, Hund's first rule, and I will put uh, one, two, three, four, five, six electrons here and you immediately see S equals zero, L equals zero. So um, by changing the crystal field, you can actually bring different multiplets uh, to the ground state. So here, this is an S equal two multiplet, and this is an S equal zero multiplet for the ground state, depending on the size of the crystal field. And I would like to demonstrate to you that you can store information in this. This is classical, classical information. And the uh, prototypic uh, system is uh, a spin crossover molecule. So this is the molecule, iron phenandryl. There are two phenandryl groups. These are these pi uh, systems of carb hydrocarbons. And then there are nitrogens here that uh, bind to the iron. And it has two legs, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur. Here, the two legs. And if you have a careful look, this is exactly the uh, symmetry we are talking about. And then we can have, depending on the size of the crystal field, the S equal two, which we call the high spin state, or the S equal zero, which is the low spin state. And the design of this molecule is actually the, uh, the difficult part. So uh, you want that uh, there is uh, a way to switch between the two states. And that's a uh, very fine energy balance. So it doesn't work for every molecule. You have to play around, and the rules are very difficult. But this molecule, for example, shows a, a transition. In the bike, it's a phase transition um, between, at high temperature, a high spin state, and at low temperatures, a low spin state. So this sounds a little bit counterintuitive. All the magnetic systems become magnetic at low temperatures. This one becomes non-magnetic at low temperature, and it's magnetic at high temperatures but it's not magnetically ordered. So these are, this is a paramagnet. And the reason why at high temperature the magnetic state wins is just because the magnetic state has S equal two. So I have five states there. There's a multiplet with five states. So the entropy in this case is bigger. And then this has only one state, it's non-magnetic. So basically that's the story. And the transition uh, uh, comes with this deformation of the molecule. So in the low spin state, the crystal field is high and these ligands are close to the iron two plus. And in the high spin state, they are further away. So it's a very detailed balance. It, you have to fine tune the energies here. And uh, um, this uh, spin crossover was only seen so far when we started this, it was only seen uh, in, in the bulk phase. So as soon as you put this on the surface, the effect was gone because the fine tuning was basically destroyed by van der Waals interactions or whatever. The molecule has a different energy landscape and the effect was gone. But let's have a look. Uh, I'm not so sure if, uh, if Mathieu de Tacon explained XMCD, did he? Not. Okay, so these are XMCD or X-ray absorption spectroscopy measurements. And it's actually, since uh, I didn't prepare a slide, I have to do it on the board. 
So basically, you have um, you have core levels and you have uh, 3D states which are partially occupied. And what you do is, an, by absorption of a photon, so it must come from a p-state, obviously. So somewhere there are p-states, let's say one p, and then you have a dipole allowed transition to this one, and you use uh, circular polarized light. So that means you s choose the change of mz, and then uh, this may be spin polarized or magnetic if you like, and then the absorption coefficient depends on if you have left or right circular polarized light. It differs. And then you can probe actually the magnetic state here, and it's element specific, and uh, 1p. Jesus Christ, 2p. <laughs> so a 2p, and then you have spin orbit splitting, which you can see uh, as two absorption lines, the A2 and A3 edge. And um, this is for powder. So the lower spin has this kind of structure. Basically, it maps the unoccupied states in this molecule, and the high spin has a different um, structure. And uh, if you place uh, these molecules by molecular beam epitaxy on a copper surface, you see the green curve here. And you immediately notice there are two peaks, prominent peaks, and this one uh, agrees with the low spin, and that one agrees with the high spin. And indeed, you can make a linear combination of the low spin and high spin powder data. This transition is done just by changing the temperature. And you can fit the green curve by roughly 50-50 of high spin and low spin molecules. And you can make uh, an XMCD, so that is, you, you measure the same for right and left circular po uh, polarized light. And this is the molecules on the surface, and this is the powder in the high spin. And you can see, basically, uh, the molecules are intact. You have the same electronic structure, the same magnetism. So we have two types, 50-50, roughly, high spin and low spin on the surface. And you do the experiment with STM. Now you see STM images. I think I don't need to uh, explain to you what STM is. But the basic thing is we, mm, if we take a constant current image, we are on ISO surfaces of the integrated density of states. So we see the electron clouds. We see the wave function, basically. So what you see is the wave function. And um, you immediately see there are two kinds of molecules. This one has a large distance, and this one a small distance. Now, this would speak for a higher crystal field, the low spin, and this one for a lower crystal field, so the high spin state. Now, what do we see here? Um, the molecules have these sulfur uh, legs, and sulfur selectively binds to copper. So that means we have the two wings of this butterfly and the two legs, and the two legs bind to, to the copper surface, and the wings are exposed. That's what we see, the density of states of the spy electron system. If you uh, put your chip on the molecules and you make a, a differential conductance uh, measurement, so the IDV, that's proportional to the density of states of the samples as a function of energy. We are in low energy range. OK, the substrate is boring, as we, uh, as we heard. Uh, when was it? Today? In the morning. So um, this energy scale is small compared to the Fermi energy. So the density of states can be approximated by a constant. And on the low spin molecule, this is very similar. Uh, there is nothing particularly seen. But if you are on the high spin uh, molecules, there is this strong peak. And the peak comes from a condo effect. I will explain to you later if you're not familiar with it. That is the singlet that forms between the conduction electrons and the localized spin. So we know this one has a localized spin, this not. So we really can identify which one is high spin and low spin. And in principle, you can. You can have this image, and then you set your bias voltage very close to zero. That means you are on this uh, condo peak and measure the IDV now at fixed energy, but as function of position in this image. So you ask what's the density of state at zero bias, roughly. And that is, that's the low spin molecule, and you see nothing particular. And the high spin molecule there in the middle, where the iron sits, is this condo cloud, which tells you, OK, our condo is really an iron condo and not of the, let's say, of the ligands. There's no spin on the ligands. This really sits on the iron. Now, of course, to you, now you have two states, a magnetic and a non-magnetic state. 
uh, we wanted to store information in this, of course. And uh, we tried with the STM to manipulate and we failed. So these molecules cannot be switched. And the reason is uh, this selective binding. So actually if the molecule lands on a certain configuration, um, basically the leg configuration sets if it's high spin or low spin and it, they cannot be altered. So actually these two have slightly different absorption geometries. So the way out is actually to reduce the interaction to the substrate. So the sulfur oxidizes the copper, chemically speaking, and uh, so we pre-oxidize now the surface. We do this by copper nitrogen. This is the cup, uh, thin layer. Copper nitrogen is a insulator. This is just one monolayer thick, so it, uh, uh, you can still tunnel through it. We can do STM, and uh, the chemical bond is reduced. And again, we see two types, a low spin and a high spin. They differ in the height a little bit, and in the spectrum, the low spin has just a boring spectrum, and the high spin has this condo peak, which is now is sharper. The condo temperature is uh, lower because we decouple the system slightly by the insulator. And uh, the funny thing is that when you reduce this binding to the substrate, you can switch the system. So let's assume you are on a high spin molecule, which has the condo peak. It appears also higher in the image. That means the current, if I fix my tip in position, is high. So this is the IV curve for a high spin. And this is the IV curve for blue one with the same distance from, from uh, of the tip to the molecule for the low spin. But if I do a cyclic uh, uh, a cycle in the bias voltage, so let's say I, I'm started with a high spin, I go up, and then at positive voltage suddenly my current jumps down and I'm on the blue curve, I can go backwards, and if I'm at negative voltage, it jumps back to this high spin state. And we can interrupt this curve here or there, so on the blue or the, or, or the red line, and we can really see we switch between those two molecules, the high spin with this bump here, the low spin has nothing, and low spin no condo, high spin has a condo. So we can switch between them. And yep. Hmm? Oh, I mean, I have uh, I have a program which alters my bias voltage, and then I just ramp up. So I me measure the stuff before, and then I ramp the voltage up. I see this jump, go back to zero voltage, and then I'm basically at this blue curve, and I'm or close to zero and I make an image. The interesting part, this is bistable. Yeah? It's bistable in a range between these two voltages. And if I exceed the voltage, I will decide which state it is. So this is what you call a mem resistor in electronic circuitry uh, theory. It's a resistor that has a memory of the past. And the past would be, was my bias voltage large positive or large negative? And that's actually quite nice. These are programmable resistors, and they can be used in, in networks for uh, uh, setting a weight on a uh, neural network, for example, and it can be self-learning. And for example, uh, Hewlett Packard is working on this to build a, a simple neural network, uh, not in software, but in hardware. Now let's have a short look at the switching. So let's assume we are in the low spin. I recall we go to negative bias voltage to go to the high spin. That's here. So this is the trace. We are at low bias voltage where we do not change the state of the molecule. A negative programming voltage will change the low spin to the high spin. A positive voltage, we go back from the high spin to the low spin. I can switch again and again. This is completely deterministic, so we can actually have a nice memory. And uh, we can do two programming with the same bias voltage. So in the high spin, a positive will lead to the low spin. Now I'm the low spin, and I give again a positive pulse, nothing happens, it stays in this state. So it's also uh, not a toggle memory, it's really sensitive to the polarity. Yes, so in this case we can store information in the length of the spin. Um, and it's a classical movement of the uh, of the ligand, so it's, it's not really good for quantum information. But the density here, one molecule takes about one nanometer square. You can immediately do the calculation with the area of a post stamp. You can store the complete internet. Unfortunately, we need 
about three seconds to program, so I will never see the day when everything is stored on this stamp. <laughs> so it's purely academic. It's uh, not really an application. So that was actually changing the size of the multiplet. Now we go to lower energies. We will look at a, a particular multiplet. Let's, let, let's say an S equal 2 multiplet. Are all of the diff different five states, do they have the same energy? So for this we have the crystal field Hamiltonian and we translate it. Oh, this should be, yeah, this should be the zero, uh, there is a mistake in my slides here. This is the zero field Hamiltonian now. And uh, we will write it as a polynomial in operators or as a sum of operators. B and M are the constant and O are the operators. And um, these operators are the Stevens operators that also Wolfgang Wernstoffer introduced to you. Um, yes. And uh, to, to remind you, the small n here is the order of the operator in the angular momentum, either j or s, uh, uh, components. And uh, the m is the order of the raising and lowering operators. I don't know what, what Wolfgang uh, told you, but uh, this is basically constructing a Hermitian mat matrix for the, uh, for the 2j plus 1 states that you have. You split them. And uh, the diagonal elements are these here. They have no raising and lowering operators. And the off diagonal are these ones. And it's a Hermitian operator, so you can split it into a, a real part and the purely imaginary part that's done in, in this way. So this is a convention for these operators. And then there are no terms with odd n, just simply because um, electromagnetic interaction is not uh, uh, violating the time reversal uh, symmetry. So, or in other words, if I have an eigenstate with a spin in this direction, uh, it, the time evolution of this state is trivial. It just states, stays there. And if I make a movie of this and play it backwards, the energy of the state will not change. But all of my angular momentum will be opposite direction, and I will come to the negative state. So that means the state with positive and negative m must have the same energy. And this uh, requires that the order n is even, because we O and m is something like jz to the power of n. So if I have a j square, jz square, this does not depend on the sign of m, but if I would cho choose j to the third power, I will violate um, time reversal. Then there are no states with n larger than 2j. This is just because we have uh, 2j two, two plus 1 times 2j plus 1 matrix, and we don't need more coefficients. Or in other words, um, my multiplet is, is, is limited and I don't need raising operators to a power larger than my, the size of my multiplet. Then I would be outside the multiplet and the raising operators will be zero or lowering operators. And then f actually what part of the electron wave function feels the electrostatic potential, it's not the spin. The spin is insensitive to electrostatic potentials. So um, it's only the orbitals and that means actually um, also n is limited by 2L, that means for 3D elements, n equals 4 is the maximum we have to consider, and for 4F, um, it's n equals 6. And for the 3D states, I told you that you can quench the orbital momentum, so we will just use S, and for 4F, we will use J, the total angular momentum. And moreover, uh, the crystal symmetry, or the ligand symmetry, um, constraints the number I can use for m. So if it's a threefold rotation symmetry, then m must be th multiple of three. So zero, three, s and six, for example. Or if it's twofold symmetric, I have zero, two, four, and six. Others would violate the uh, point symmetry of the uh, of, a, of the uh, impurity. And if I have a mirror plane in the system, we can forget about the complex part of this uh, Hamiltonian. So this was in a nutshell, hopefully, what Wolfgang uh, has explained to you. And the operators look nasty. These are the operators. 
Um, so we have, uh, let's look a simple one. Uh, order two in M order zero, that means there's no raising and lowering operators. That is just one term, this JZ square. And there are some other factors in here which come from convention, basically. If you go to f uh, four zero, there is, uh, there is a fourth order of JZ in there, but there are also second order. Uh, X is a constant. We can actually forget X because it shifts the whole uh, multiplet just up and down. We go to 022, that's now a polynomial of second order with second order and raising and lowering operators, and this must be symmetric. That's J plus and J minus to the square. So, how do you find out how the multiplet splits? One idea is to do ESR, electron or EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. Then you would induce transitions according to the magnetic dipole selection rule. That means um, delta ms or delta mj is zero plus minus one, and you don't change the multiplet. But typically, crystal fields can be relatively large. I will show you examples where there are hundreds of milli electron volts. And you immediately see that uh, uh, a paramagnetic resonance ex experiment would require you to go infrared, and this cannot be done. So we need another technique, and there STM helps. So as discussed, uh, I think it was today, that um, if we tunnel from um, at between two, two um, conducting leads, we have the elastic tunneling. That means uh, my, my electrons from the tip, for example, here will, uh, under energy con conservation, fill empty spaces in the sample. And, and uh, um, if we assume that these bias voltages are small, we can say, OK, our density of states is basically not changing with voltage. And that means I get a linear IV curve, which you see here. But during the tunneling process, the electron can get rid of some of this energy. Let's say you hit a nucleus, you make a vibration. So you heat this. There should be heat somewhere here because you put power in the system. That would heat up the system, the phonon system. But the, maybe this is also a magnetic excitation, like the excitation in the multiplet. And to that this ca can happen actually means that after the loss of h bar omega, the uh, energy of this excitation, my final state must be still unoccupied. So for t equals zero, this is a sharp function. So this inelastic channel will exactly open at h bar omega. And you can reverse the bias, then you can argument, argue with holes that works the same way, and uh, you get the same uh, onset voltage, but this time negative. And now the final state of the elastically tunneled and the inelastically tunneled are different, and that means there are no interference terms here. So that means I can just add up the currents. And it's a bit, little bit counterintuitive. That means if I have no scattering and I have only the elastic channel, the conductance is lower than if I introduce scattering. But it's just the argument that I have more final density of states here. So in an experiment, the DIDV, or sorry, the IOV will at h bar omega of this excitation have a kink. The elastic plus the inelastic current, the inelastic will also rise linearly. Or in the first derivative, I will have a step. These kind of steps you will see. Or in the second derivative, I have an anti-symmetric uh, delta function at the, at the excitation energy. And loosely speaking, we, uh, with elastic tunneling, we measure the density of states <coughs> of the fermions in the system. And with the second derivative of the tunneling current, we measure the density of states of the bosons. So there's a boson here, h bar omega, and we, if we can excite it, we will see it. Of course, it's weighted by the matrix element for this. How am I doing in time? OK. so. Um, the first experiment regarding spins was done in planar tunnel junctions in the 60s, but STM can also see this. And the first paper is from Andreas Heinrich from the IBM group in 2004. 
And the scenario is like this. We have a manganese atom in this case. It sits on the surface. Let's say it's magnetized up. We come with tunneling electrons, and let's say the tunneling electron has a spin down. And now um, we have an exchange interaction between the electron and the manganese, which is capital S for the manganese spin and low S for the electron, which is, uh, if I write it down, is the uh, diagonal part. Nothing much happens to the spins. This is just elastic, and I can have um, a, a transfer of angular momentum or spin momentum in this case with raising and lowering operators in, in the anti-symmetric combinations. So for example, in this case, this manganese is up, so I can lower the spin by the S minus operator and the electron is spin down, so I can increase with the S plus operator. So this electron will be spin flipped and one H bar is transferred to the system, just like in a ESR experiment by the absorption of a photon. So the selection rules are actually completely identical and this is an inelastic channel, and if there's an energy difference between this state and this state, I will see a step in the DIDV. Now, manganese, to recall, is in the middle of the periodic table. 5d electrons, L equals zero. So you do not expect a spin-orbit interaction, or it's small. In first order, it would vanish, and that means there should be no zero field splitting. So at zero field, all the states have the same energy, yeah, because Basically, there is no angular momentum to couple to. And uh, that means um, there's only, if you have a spin flip scattering event, it's elastic. And you have a just a completely constant DIDV spectrum. But if you apply a magnetic field, you skew the multiplet. Yeah? And then there is a decisive, decisive ground state. And then you can, you need energy to go from this ground state to the first excited state. And then you can see here, this happens. So this is the manganese atom. And then if at zero Tesla, there's nothing. At B equals seven Tesla, you can see this inelastic step. And you can f vary uh, this uh, step position. Now this is limited by the energy resolution of the instrument. It's at 500 millikelvin, but you can see that the step linearly moves with the magnetic field. You can plot this, and then you can get the G factor and it's two because in this case, the orbital momentum is not there, and you only have spin momentum, so this gives you the two, uh, yeah, the two. This one, this molecule, uh, this uh, manganese atom was placed on an insulator, but there are also, where well you can see this, but there are also atoms on the met metallic surface, and strangely, you see no excitation. So at that stage in 2004, it was believed that this only works for spins on insulators and that the spin flip scattering is magically switched off. And uh, we didn't believe that because spin, I mean, nothing I explained here actually depends on if this molecules or this ion, this magnetic object sits on an insulator film or not. But maybe the cross section is, is different. So we, we entered that field, uh, I just, uh, a year later, our, our publication was in NPRL that you can see this also without insulators. I will s give you an example uh, of a later paper where you can also get uh, interesting information on the, m the dispersion of these objects. So let's assume you have uh, a layered system. So this is now a lot of atoms. They are layered. Um, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight layers for simple for simplicity at this moment, I assume they are ferromagnetically coupled. And then um, you have a dispersion of magnons, magnetic excitations, and there, are, there is a k-vector in the plane, which makes you these branches. And if you take this k parallel to zero, you still have the different branches, like no node in the film thickness, one node, two nodes, three nodes, etc., up to seven nodes. In the film, these are standing magnons because here is a vacuum. That's where our STM tip will be. That's the substrate, which is non-magnetic. So the magnons are inside the magnetic film. And if you plot these uh, these points here at zero parallel momentum, you can construct uh, again a dispersion curve from this for the yep for the quasi momentum here. So this is a standing mode. Strictly speaking, it has no momentum, but classically you would 
describe it as a round traveling group, uh, 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 Magnon, and then what, what comes out is exactly the bike dispersion of Magnons in this case. And the experiment, uh, the first experiment we did was on an antiferromagnet, so this is manganese again, on copper three gold surface, and you can see the STM topographies, so you know, 5.8 monolayers or 24 monolayers, and you can see flat terraces, and the film has a particular thickness here. On average, it's 24 monolayers, but locally it may differ. And these are the inelastic spectra as function of layer thickness, so 4, 6, 8, 10, 8, 18, and 24. And you clearly see anti-symmetric peaks and dips in the second derivative. These are the, if you like, the bosonic density of states, and they correspond to the standing modes. And you see if you um, make the, the film thinner, this first mode for, uh, this, uh, let's see, this is the first mode, and this is the second mode, they clearly disperge out. That uh, basically means the energy gets higher when you confine the magnon uh, in, in length. That's what you expect because uh, this is a standing, is a, like a pipe, a shorter pipe has a higher frequency. And from that you can reconstruct the, with arrow bars, the dispersion. These are our points. And we did also uh, ab initio calculation. Our partner did ab initio calculation. This is the ab initio result. And um, manganese is in FCC configuration, and in bike it does not exist in FCC. So to force this to FCC, you can dope it with uh, nickel, 17%, and then you can take bike samples to the neutral uh, to uh, neutron scattering. That's this paper from '95. Um, that is the black curve. This is bike neutron data, and you see everything agrees pretty well. So with STM, that means we can look at these bosonic excitations with STM resolution, yeah, nanometer resolution or atomic resolution ultimately, and we can even reconstruct the dispersion curve. It agrees actually pretty well. So here I make the break. Good. <laughs>